everyone, and welcome to Murder and Merlot. We are a true crime book club podcast. I'm your host, Tara. And I'm your host, Michelle. How's it going, Michelle? Well, we had no leg, and now as soon as we started recording, we have legs, so that's nice. Seriously. <laughs> Everything was going too well. <laughs> Zoom just was working on oh, point, man. and then it was like, psych. Right? Anyways, besides that, I'm on day seven of quarantine Mm -hmm. because I unfortunately had a close contact with a COVID positive case. So yeah, how's that going? It was a little stressful for a couple of days, but yay, COVID negative. (laughs) Um, It's fine. I'm pretty used to not leaving my house anyways. So totally. I mean, we've pretty much had a year of practice of it now. So yeah, it's it's nothing crazy. Right. And um, as of... Friday, I officially own a farm. Ah. So it's like this crazy thing that happened. Yeah. Yay. Crazy times. That's so exciting though. I know. It's so weird because it's like we bought my mother-in-law's farm and it's so anticlimactic. Like we didn't have to go pick up keys and we didn't have to Mm -hmm. like go like take the sold sign down or anything. Like it was just like, oh yeah, you, you own this now. You should have put a sign up just to take it down, just for, just for right? the gram. Just something. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> have a photo op. <laughs> right. Except I can't go anywhere. So I can't right. even go to my farm. <laughs> well, damn. <laughs> well, that's very exciting and congratulations. And obviously that means that our farming talk will continue on the podcast. Because, Absolutely. You know, that's our jam Absolutely. apparently. <laughs> totally. Murder and farming, like, why not? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Uh, Excellent. Well, today we are doing a book club, which I'm excited about. I love our book club episodes. And this is obviously our Helter Skelter book club episode. And we've been knowing this is coming for like, you know, over a year. This is a big one. So I'm just super excited. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. And I just, I can't wait to gush about this book. (laughs) Spoiler alert. I like it. (laughs) If you can. Uh, Yeah, I think, I think we like it. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. Uh, But we'll get more into it here right away. Um, I just had a couple clarifications about my part four. Um, I included zero in the end of the episode like while we were remembering the victims, because I'm certain he was a victim of the Manson family. But just to clarify, his death was ruled as a suicide. So technically, he's not considered one of the confirmed victims. Uh Yes, (laughs) I was just listening back to it. And then I'm like, well, I guess technically, I mean, he's a victim, but I, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there just so there was no confusion that nothing had changed. It's still ruled a suicide. Cool. And then also a correction, even though you told me not to fact check you, Michelle, I'm sorry, but I did come across a picture of Sharon Tate and her baby's gravestone and the unborn baby's name was Paul Richard Polanski. Oh, okay. But it's, it was a boy. At least it I was, was right a boy. You were right about that. I was like, ah, oh, yes. Should I be, should I be a dick? Do I bring this up? But I figured. Oh, be the dick. It's fine. Well, it's totally fine. <laughs> we should probably correct ourselves when we, we find things like that. So <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one more thing before we jump into our book club, voice memos. I discovered voice memos on Instagram and I thought it'd be really cool if, you know, you wanted to answer our fluff and stuff questions. You can just go to the DMs, talk right into the microphone. And then if you send us that, then we could just, we could just play your voice on the podcast and you could respond to our, like I said, fluff and Uh, stuff. Yeah. You guys need to do that. Yeah. Or our book clubs. Like we could have somebody send us a voice memo. (laughs) Please. You could answer our questions for the book club. And it'd be like, we're actually having like a book club with more than two people. Like that would be super cool. So I just wanted to throw that out there. We'd be totally open to that. We think it would be amazing. So keep that in mind. I didn't know this was a thing, but yes, please send us voice memos. That would be fun. I know. I feel like probably other people are aware of this, but I'm like, oh my God, I just discovered this. This is incredible. Whatever. I'm old. I got an excuse. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) And yeah, that's all I had for the, the top of the show. Cool. All right. 
friends, grab your glass and get cozy. Let's book club it up. Dink. Dink. Man, I feel like we haven't done a book club in forever. Well, it's because we've had like a hundred years of Manson, so. I know, I was just going to say. <laughs> Sorry, I really drug that one out, but I mean, it's it's necessary. And our last book club was like a two book book club, mm-hmm. so. Right, yeah. yeah, very true. All right, so like I said, today's book club is on Helter Skelter, The mm-hmm. True Story of the Manson Murders by Vincent Bugliosi and Kurt Gentry. So mm-hmm. I will start by reading the synopsis, which is short and sweet. It began August 9th and 10th, 1969, when seven people were shot, stabbed, and bludgeoned to death in Los Angeles. It ended when a nation watched in fascinated horror as the killers were tried and convicted. But the real questions went unanswered. How did Manson make his family kill for him? How could these young men and women kill again and again without human feelings of any kind? Did the murders go on even after Manson was in jail? Now, for the first time, we have the answers. Awesome. And about the authors, Vincent Bugliosi received his undergraduate degree at the University of Miami, which he attended on a tennis scholarship, interestingly enough, and his law degree from UCLA, where he was president of his class. At the time of the Manson case, he was deputy district attorney, Los Angeles, and a professor of criminal law at the Beverly School of Law in Los Angeles. He is currently in private practice. And Kurt Gentry is a highly successful writer of nonfiction. Two of his most recent books are The Last Days of the Late, Great State of California, and Frame Up, a brilliant recreation of the famous Mooney Billings murder case. All right. So first, let's talk about the physical book, title, cover, feel, first impressions, all that good stuff. I have a hard time answering this one. Oh, okay. (laughs) Because... The first time I read this book, it was like my mom's stolen copy off of the bookshelf. And it's mm-hmm. the same copy that you, you mm-hmm. have, right? Yeah. And it was like, old. the pages are yellowed. Like, it's like, you know, somebody's loved this book before. So mm-hmm. I love, love that. But when I got my copy, it's a different version. It's bigger. And then like the cover is black with the red Helter Skelter mm-hmm. on it. And then it feels nice, but my first impression is hard to say because like I said, I read it when I was way too young, but I'm going to go off of when I read it most recently, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's kind of like a warm blanket, which is a weird way to describe a book, Absolutely, but it's like familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's comfortable and I don't know. I just like it. (laughs) That's amazing. That's amazing. (laughs) Okay. Well, Yes. So I have that copy of the book that you were talking about, which is funny because I had also stolen that Helter Skelter book from somebody else. And (laughs) it's the really old worn version. But then eventually I realized that I had stole it. So then I had to return it. So then I specifically went on the internet to find that version of the book because it just, Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a warm blanket, like you said. Now, (laughs) the worn books, they do generally look loved, like you said, but mine right Mm -hmm. now is looking like I, I hate it. Literally falling apart. Like I just ripped it to shreds. The cover of my book is currently not attached. (laughs) And this makes me very, very sad. I told you I can fix that. (laughs) I know, I know, but I just, I feel horrible. (laughs) It's like a little bit worn is like perfect. It's like, ah, yes. But mine is like beat to shit (laughs) but absolutely it's been abused it's been abused it's been used it's been um yeah well gone through um (laughs) but yeah I definitely have a a bias to this book and I have um strong feelings about this inanimate object and what I wrote is pretty much exactly like you said like it gives me a warm feeling of nostalgia like it is a Mm -hmm. warm blanket 100% um and I (laughs) I love the vintage worn look of it. And I love that the first thing it says when you open the book is that it reads, the story you're about to read will scare the hell out of you. And I'm like, oh, I love that. (laughs) My little dark and twisty soul is just like, that's perfect. Uh, It's amazing. Okay, I'll read that. (laughs) Okay. Sounds good to me, right? (laughs) Sounds like my jam. Um, And then also interesting little fact, I kind of designed our podcast cover art with Helter Skelter in mind, if anybody has Mm -hmm. noticed, (laughs) because the book has aged yellow pages, and then there's the dark red text, and the murder almost looks like it's written in blood, 
much like the walls at the crime scenes and just like the book cover itself. And I'm not sure if anybody else has noticed this, but the book in our podcast logo is actually a Bible. So I feel like it, it ties into the culty vibes. It's very that we, fitting. That we love so much. <laughs> yes. I'm so sorry. That was my very long winded <laughs> explanation about how much I love this book and the feel of it. <laughs> Happiness is a warm blanket, right? Mm-hmm. Not quite like how the Beatles say it. Happiness is a warm gun, but you know, <laughs> yeah. for us, it's a warm blanket. <laughs> But also that feels appropriate when talking about right? this book and case. Totally. <laughs> I know. So fitting. Yeah. All right. Who chose this book and why? Well, um, Tara chose it this time. Mm-hmm. But funnily enough, my Google Photos memories just popped up that two years ago, we were reading this book together for the first time. And I think I picked it then. Yes. So. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've both had our turns picking this book, but right. um, yeah, we just knew we wanted to cover a big case for our anniversary and, mm-hmm. you know, something to come off of BTK. Exactly. You know, it <laughs> needed to be big to come off of BTK because he's icky. Uh- <laughs> Absolutely. And not that, you know, it's necessarily a, a fun case or a a, a better no. case, you know, it's still absolutely brutal, but for some reason, it's significantly better than BTK. It's different. I know. Yeah. I, it's, I hate that guy. It's a different <laughs> vibe for sure. And yeah, BTK was a big undertaking for you. So then mm-hmm. I wanted to take on a big case as well. So yes. I don't think there's there's really a lot of other cases that are bigger than the Manson murders. No. I mean, there's a, mm, there's a few, but. There's a few big ones, of course, but like, it's so complicated. Yes. <laughs> as we yeah. Have. The twists and the turns that come in Helter Skelter, it's just, Mm -hmm. it's a lot. (laughs) Totally. Uh, Tara, what did you know about this subject before reading the book? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure because I read this book when I was quite young, as we've said in the past. Um, I had been interested in true crime before that from watching like murder dogs with my granny, but I honestly can't remember if I heard about this case before diving into the book or that I just knew that this book was for some reason iconic and classic and I just needed to read it. Um, So yeah, I borrowed the book from my neighbor and held on to it for many, many, many years. And And here we are. (laughs) And here we are. And now I'm on, I own my own book, which is good because I would hate to do that to anybody else's book. <laughs> what about you? Cool. Um, well, considering it's my third time I read it, I, I knew quite a bit going in this time. Right. But before I read it the first time, I'm pretty sure I knew that Charles Manson was a bad dude and he carved a swastika on his forehead and that was about it. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, Do you think this book is overrated or underrated? I can't say it's underrated. Mm -hmm. Um, And considering it's the number one true crime bestseller of all time with Mm -hmm. the label on the top of my book, um, I don't even feel right saying that it's overrated. Like it's totally, it's the number one true crime bestseller of all time for a reason. Yes, exactly. I just said it's very highly rated as it should be because yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um. What did you like best about this book? Well, I'm all about the little details and this book definitely delivers. Every little piece of evidence and conversation is noted. And I also love that the author included additional notes at the bottom of the pages to explain things further, especially when it came to complicated laws that I would have no idea what they were talking about. Uh, So not only was it entertaining, but it was very educational and I'm such a dark and twisty nerd that I'm like that's perfect for me what about you (laughs) I'm laughing you're gonna laugh yeah um my favorite thing about the the book was the level of detail that Bugliosi (laughs) is able to share (laughs) all while keeping it on track yes because there is a shit ton of information in there but you never feel muddled or overwhelmed in the details Mm -hmm. I also really enjoyed the insight that he gave into the the legal process of what happens in a major murder trial and the footnotes because the footnotes man (laughs) Mint. <laughs> Mint. So basically, essentially, our answers are same. exactly the same, <laughs> like like every book club episode ever. Always. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. 
and it is interesting because we've read other books where there's been a lot of details and we got lost in them and we didn't enjoy them as much, but the details in this book are easily kept track of. So yeah, I really appreciated that part of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what did you like least about the book? I have a hard time answering this question too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's nothing that really stands out that I don't like. Mm -hmm. What about you? This time reading it, I didn't have anything that stood out to me that I didn't like. The few times, well, mostly the first time that I read the book, I was just too young to comprehend everything that was going on and really understand mm -hmm. some of the importance of like the pre-trial interviews and testimonies. Like, for example, I was like, what? They're interviewing Susan Atkins again, like in front of a jury this time, but then they can't use it in court. But right. Aren't they in court? Like, so I was just a bit confused about that. But at the same time, I don't think I was 100% mm -hmm. full attention to all of the details. Now reading it, it all made sense. I can totally understand why all of that was important information to include. Um, so yeah, this time reading it, I yeah. have no complaints. Yep, same. Do you have a favorite quote from the book or more than one quote like I have? <laughs> well, I only chose one quote for the book this time, which is, I know, surprising. Uh, but one, I what? may have, <laughs> I know. I have four. <laughs> nice. I love that. <laughs> but I kind of overdid it in my case episodes and I used so many quotes from the book that I was like, <laughs> okay, this is excessive. <laughs> um, and two, it took me over an hour to find this quote again in the book because I marked down my page number wrong. So I had to flip through the entire book looking no. for one word. And I swore, I was like, I thought it was in the beginning, but I went through the beginning like five times and I could not find it. So I went through the whole book. So I'm page 24 out of like 700. Oh, <laughs> so, fuck. Anyways, oh, man. <laughs> it was brutal. So that's why I only have one quote. Um, but the quote that I picked was... In literature, a murder scene is often linked to a picture puzzle. If one is patient and keeps trying, eventually all the pieces will fit into place. Veteran policemen know otherwise. A much better analogy would be two picture puzzles, or three, or more, no one of which in itself is complete. Even after a solution emerges, if one does, there will be leftover pieces, evidence that just doesn't fit, and some pieces will always be missing. And I just feel like that describes the Manson murders story just so well, so, so well. There's so much going on. Perfectly. I actually got goosebumps while you said that. Perfect. <laughs> I love that. But there's so many murders. There's so many murderers. Like there's so much just happening in the world that it's mm -hmm. like, there's like 10 puzzles going on here. And there's all kinds of pieces missing. Some are like broken half. Some are like under the couch. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I do have a bonus quote though. It's not from the book, but it's from Charles Manson. My favorite Charles Manson quote of all times is, if you're going to do something, do it well and leave something witchy. Yes. It's my favorite. It's words to live by. The best. And I feel yeah. like I'm going to make it some type of art print and put it on my wall because I love it. I hate the man. I think you should. Love the quote. It's a perfect quote though. It is. It truly yeah, is. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Let me hear your quotes. I'm excited. Okay. So the first one is, quote, for a lawyer to do less than his utmost is, I strongly feel a betrayal of his client. Though in criminal trials, one tends to focus on the defense attorney and his client, the accused, the prosecutor is also a lawyer, and he too has a client, the people. And the people are equally entitled to their day in court, to a fair and impartial trial, and to justice, end quote. And Love that. Mr. Bugliosi, dang, sir. Mm -hmm. It just speaks to his integrity and his commitment to his job. And it's not about who's right, it's about justice. And I love that. 100%. It's one of the reasons why I respect the man so much is because I know he's just He's got that exactly. integrity and yeah, he's, he's there to do the right thing in the end. Right. Um, my quote number two mm -hmm. is quote, the morning Charles Manson was to be freed. He begged the authorities to let him remain in prison. Prison had become his home. He told them he didn't think he could adjust to the world outside. End quote. 
Mm-hmm. Another he literally one. asked to be kept locked up and they let him out. And then he created a murderous cult. He said, I will not do well out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Please keep me locked up. And they didn't listen. I know. That's, like, that's one that's always stuck with me as well. <laughs> and immediately he, <laughs> right out of prison, he just started the cult. And within a couple of years, all of this happened. Like he worked quickly. Exactly. It's insane. I feel like if you have an inmate being like, please don't let me out because mm-hmm. I'm I'm going to do bad things, you mm-hmm. should probably keep them where they are. Yes. And if you can't, then you need to keep a close eye on, on them. But I'm pretty sure in the book, they talked about the parole officer and he just like- Oh, his parole like, officer was shit. He's like, well, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> like, but you're supposed to <laughs> be- supposed to keep tabs on him? Yeah. What? That's not in my job description, <laughs> is it? I've never read it actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> oh, and so and then another one is when Vincent Bugliosi is talking to Charlie. He says, quote, Hitler loved animals too, Charlie. He had a dog named Blondie. And from what I've read, Adolf was very kind to Blondie, end quote. And I love this because in the afterword of, I don't know if it's in your copy of the, mm. your book, but in the afterword of my book, um, Bugliosi learns that Hitler was a big influence on Charlie. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of actual comparisons to Hitler and Charles Manson. And so I'm sure that Charles Manson actually loved being compared to Hitler in that conversation. Oh, yeah, totally. I've definitely heard that he he took some inspiration from from Hitler. So yeah, yeah. And I mean, 100%. he carved a swastika on his forehead. So I mean, so that's pretty clear sign. Right? <laughs> yeah. And my last one is... Quote, the evidence will show Charles Manson to be a megalomaniac who coupled his insatiable thirst for power with an intense obsession for violent death, end quote. And oh, it's damn. the perfect description of Manson. Mm-hmm. Plus, I just really like the word megalomaniac. So. I know. <laughs> when you said it, I was like, damn, that's a good word. <laughs> it's a great word. It's one yeah. of my faves. It's funny, actually, because right before uh, we started recording, I was watching a couple uh, interviews of Vincent Bugliosi talking and he that's exactly how he described Manson in a couple of those those interviews so yeah <laughs> yeah so it's like the perfect description of him yeah exactly and it's cool to hear it directly from so, his mouth exactly what were you feeling when you read this book Tara <laughs> well I kind of already mentioned some of this but I I had a lot of feelings with this book um, starting the book, I was just so at peace, <laughs> which again, it's, is the feeling of warmth and nostalgia. And I realize it's incredibly morbid because the beginning of the book is all about discovering the horrible crime scenes and, and the brutal murder. So it's, yeah, <laughs> makes me feel morbid, but at the same time, it makes me feel warm and cozy. <laughs> um, but throughout the rest of the book, I was feeling just astonished just blown away blown away by the brutality the family the motives how all the evidence was just piecing together and how the madness just never seemed to end like in any other cases so many of the details would make headlines or really stand out but there was just so much crazy stuff happening that a lot of it just gets overlooked and no one really talks about it and because of that I think no matter how many times I read Mm -hmm. the book it will always shock me that's a really good way to put it And mine's very similar. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) I said joy, frustration, rage, sadness, Mm -hmm. basically a plethora of all the feels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it feels weird saying joy, right? Like Mm -hmm. it feels weird that I have joy reading this book because it's so horrible. But Mm -hmm. again, it's that it's what got us here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Mm -hmm. I say peace as I'm well, when I was listening to the audiobook, it's just like, it's actual madness, but I'm feeling peace. But I just remember when I started the book this time, I was working on, you know, a beautiful painting and I was just, you know, had my coffee and I was listening to the book and I was just like, oh, <laughs> I love this. And it's just so funny. Quite the juxtaposition, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're a little twisty and weird. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, but we knew that. Nothing new there. Exactly. All right. I'm excited about this question. Uh, What were your favorite pictures included in the book and why? 
Ooh. So there's a page that has multiple different pictures of Manson mm. and he looks different in each picture mm -hmm. and it really captures his ability to change his appearance to suit his motives. And I felt like it's really profound just to see all of the different faces of Charles Manson, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorites. Um, the picture of Vincent Bugliosi after the jury returned the guilty verdicts for all the defendants, you can literally see the relief in his face that he had done his job well. And I love mm -hmm. that you can see that he's like, holy shit, I did it. Right. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> and um, finally. Mm -hmm. And the picture that gets me in the field is the most, honestly, it's not the crime scene photos, which you would think that those ones would hit me in the fields, mm -hmm. but it's the picture of Stephen Parent at his prom. Oh, He's like this no. dorky 18 year old high school kid with his pretty date. And he just has so much life to live. And it kills me. It absolutely guts me. That he's Absolutely. just like this sweet kid that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hundred percent. I know we've said it so many times, but it just it kills us. And to know that he was such a, a good kid, obviously wrong place at the wrong time, like you said. He had a loving family. He was working two jobs because he was getting himself into college in the next couple months. Like so much life. So much life to be had. So much life. Yes. Yeah. Ow. What about you? What were your favorites? Oh, well, <laughs> now I'm just feeling sad. <laughs> um, I know, but it gets like, I was looking I back through them and I was like, oh man, I just, yeah, I'm a kid. <laughs> I know. Um, I also said the many faces of Manson. Uh, Squeaky often mm -hmm. described him as a changeling because every time she saw him, he seemed to be different. And I, I truly believe mm -hmm. that. And not only pictures, but if you watch interviews, like he'll be a different person every couple minutes or whenever he wants, he'll just change. So it's, it's very interesting. To suit his needs. Yeah. It's 100%. fascinating. Yeah. And depending on who he's talking to and what he wants, he will be a different person. Um, the next one, I'm surprised you exactly. didn't say, but the tiny cupboard. Mm. I love the tiny cupboard, but I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But it's so tiny. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, next one. So, sorry, there's a lot of pictures to choose from because there are 64 pages of, of pictures and most pages had a lot of pictures on each. So there's a lot of pictures. Um, right. The newspaper cover that reads, Man of the Year, Charles Manson. And this was from an underground counterculture newspaper called Tuesday's Child. And I just like this picture because it's just so absurd. And in the top right corner, it reads, do it. Page three, oily orgy, beanery, eat in. And so I'm like, wow, that obviously they're a classy and credible news source. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. Absolutely credible. <laughs> so credible. He must, he must be a great so guy. So many questions about that. <laughs> I know. I'm like, were those like awesome, all different articles or are those all the same article? Because what is going on there? <laughs> right. The morning news person in me wants that to be all one title. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I really, maybe I'll, I'll try to go down that rabbit hole and see if I can find a copy. <laughs> They're probably pretty expensive on eBay right? though. I feel <laughs> I feel like people would be selling Amazing. that that copy of that newspaper for I'm quite guessing. a bit. Damn it. We don't have it in the budget. <laughs> oh, like probably like $10,000. <laughs> Damn it. It's, it's just out of our price range. Shit. Yeah, that's too bad. Um, and finally, the last picture, which is the tiny straggly little Manson on his way to death row. It just makes me happy. Yes. He looks so wee. I know. He's so teeny, just, just like, like, and he's like tiny. kind of hunched down with his head down. Like, like, yeah, man, you were defeated. Damn it. Yep. Yep. I love it. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the book's length? Would you have shortened it or added to it? Well, it is the longest book that we have ever read. The audio book is 26 and a half True. hours long which is crazy. Other books that we've read have been between eight hours to 19 hours. 
So yeah, it's a lot, but I think the first few times I read the book, I thought it was too long because I, again, I didn't quite understand everything that was happening. Um, but now again, after having a, a better understanding mm-hmm. on how the court system works and everything like that, I can see why all the, the information and testimonies were included and were necessary. So I think it was appropriate. I think it had all the, the details that were needed. Mm-hmm. So I didn't mind the length at all. Uh, literally the same. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, you know, it was long for sure, but it was mm-hmm. necessary to be that long. So yeah, I wouldn't have changed a thing. It's extra long when you're looking for one freaking word <laughs> out of 700 pages for a specific quote. Right? <laughs> then it feels too long, but that's, that's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. That's just book club problems. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Nobody else has those problems. Just me. Love it. If you could hear the story from someone else's perspective, whose would you want to hear? George Spawn's. Ah, oh, great, great. Imagine the shit that that dude saw. Well, heard. Like, imagine the shit that he saw. Heard, saw, <laughs> whatever, you know. But still. He, he was blind. <laughs> <laughs> whatever reason, when I read it, I thought he was deaf. But yes. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm sure he heard a lot. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure he heard so much. And he's like, oh, yeah. I'm just going to keep doing like, life like this and don't not question it yeah don't mind me see no evil hear no evil yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah right I mean I would love to hear Charles's side of the story but oh. I also I wouldn't trust that he was telling the truth oh so no. I'm sticking with George Bond <laughs> oh man Charlie he's quite the storyteller like I tell you he ya. is <laughs> yeah that's that's what about you fantastic I just love that response because it didn't pop in my head like whatsoever, but I think that would be really interesting to hear. It would be so interesting. Yeah. Especially with Squeaky as like his person. Yeah. And I feel like she can't keep her mouth shut. So. Oh, hell no. I don't think so. She would have all the deets. Yeah. He would know everything. Yeah. Um, The perspective of a family member is what I would like to hear and what I actually did get to hear from Diane Lake's book, A Member of the right. Family. And I'm going to go off a little bit. I'm going to tell you all about it because I just, I really loved this Beautiful. book. And I know I've, I've mentioned the book a few times. I used it as one of my sources for writing the case episodes, but I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I think some people still have doubt about Charles Manson being behind the murders or just being a bad guy in general, but I think it's undeniable after reading her book. He was truly an evil man. He beat and raped her. He pimped her out to disgusting men when she was only 13 years old. And he gave, I know, this poor woman. And he gave lessons to the girls on how to kill, literally. And not only was there the creepy crawls, which by the way, she explained was to train them to overcome their fears and to learn to be silent and undetectable. But they, of course, had buck knives on them. And Charlie supplied all the girls with their own knives and gathered them together in some sort of weird jazzercise group. And then he had them go through an exercise. He told them to start in the chest and lift up. Thrust, jab, lift. Thrust, jab, lift. They needed to know this. Oh my God. In case they were ever in a kill or be killed situation. Like, so anybody that thinks that he didn't have anything to do with these murders, he literally taught his family how to murder. And a quote from the book that just says it all. When looking at the autopsy reports, it was chilling. To me, it left Charlie's fingerprints on the crime, almost as if he had been at the scene. Patterns of how the victims were stabbed matched Charlie's instructions. Jab, thrust, pull up. Ah. Isn't that, I just, whoa, crazy. So I feel like this book just gave so much insight into what was really happening there. Yeah. And how wow. evil he was. But um, anyways, in summary, I thought it was an incredible book and it's truly underrated. It gives that insight mm-hmm. a as to how someone could end up in a cult like that, much like David Thibodeau's book, Waco. 
And it also explains mm-hmm. more about the events leading up to the murders, after the murders, once they were arrested, the trial, and life after the family. And it pairs so nicely with Helter Skelter. So if you're already in the in the rabbit hole that is the Manson murders, then you should check it out. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Really interesting. And I said it on one of the case episodes, but if you listen to the audiobook, at least on Audible is where I listen to it. Um, Diane Lake reads it herself and it just, oh wow, it really gets to me, especially like talking about her childhood and the things that happened to her. Just, oh, it, it just really hurts so much more because it's the actual person describing it. Yeah. So yeah, so oh, really, really good. Sorry, my cat just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> All of a sudden, something in my sock container just was like moving and it was my cat. So it's fine. Mm. He's never slept there before. That's fine. Nice. <laughs> my first thought was gremlins. I don't know why, but <laughs> maybe. Like, holy shit, something's moving in my socks. Okay, never mind. It's just my cat. Fun. Fun times. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what song does this book make you think of, Tara? Oh, this yeah. my favorite question always. I know. And just one song, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I do not just have one. No, mm-hmm. no. Even though uh, that sounded like donut. Um, <laughs> do not. I really, I really want powdered donuts right now. I've been wanting donuts for days. So it's because I'm stuck at home and I can't go anywhere. Well, okay. <laughs> I need to stop thinking about donuts because now my mind is somewhere else. I was like, I will find them. I will bring them to you. <laughs> we will enjoy them together. And then I'm like, wait, focus. We are Teen. recording a podcast. <laughs> oh my God. Amazing. Anyways. So yes, this question, best question ever. I think this is going to be a great playlist. Just saying. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure we're going to have some overlap here. The obvious ones here being, of course, Helter Skelter, Piggies, Blackbird, and Revolution 9 by the Beatles. Basically, we could just include the entire White Album here, but those are the main songs that Manson focused on. Mm -hmm. And I will also add, I want to hold your hand to uh, the Beatles list because that was Diane Lake's favorite song and it helped her get through really tough times. Oh, and I love that song. I do too. But it also reminds me of the movie Walk Hard in the part that they say, <laughs> you know who's got hands? The devil. And he uses them for holding. <laughs> is that is like one of my favorite movies. And I hope Very people fitting. know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> love it. Yes. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Revolution Blues by Neil Young. During Manson's Mm. attempt to become famous, he crossed paths with Neil Young a few times, and they would even jam together. Neil was one of the only people that gave him any time of day and thought he had some potential. He later went on to write Revolution Blues, which was inspired by Manson. Mm -hmm. Love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Glad to See You Go by Ramones. Uh, (laughs) Do you have yep. that one? <laughs> no, I like no? that though. Okay. Uh, the song is basically about wanting to kill his girlfriend and getting the glory like Charles Manson. So, you know, it's pretty suiting. Yeah. It's kind of messed it's... up, but it's very it's suiting. A little weird, yeah. For this playlist. Uh, Bloodbath in Paradise by Ozzy. Uh, the song is, <laughs> is yeah, clearly written about the Manson murders. The opening lyrics are, you're coming home, there's blood on the walls, and the family made house calls. If you're alone, then watch what you do, because Charlie and the family might get you. And yeah, he also mentions Helter Skelter a few times in the song, so obviously it's very appropriate. (laughs) Very, very, yes. Yeah. And speaking of Ozzy, I just, I need to give a TikTok account a shout out, which is at Hail Ozzy. Anybody on TikTok that is a fan of Ozzy like we are, you should go check it out because it's just hilarious clips of the Osbournes. Like it's just fantastic. They're the best. (laughs) It's it's just Ozzy mumbling about nonsense and usually Sharon is just like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, yes, sweetie. And like just going along with it. And it's just- Love it. It's it's my favorite thing on TikTok. So I wanted to give them a shout out. (laughs) Fantastic. Yes. Uh, a couple more. 
Look at Your Game Girl, Guns N' Roses. This song was actually written by Manson and apparently was played at his funeral. And I'm not going to lie, and it pains me to say this, but I actually liked Manson's version better. You can find it on YouTube. Interesting. It's actually good. And I, I don't want I don't want to give him any credit. I want to, you know, he's a shit human. Hmm. But actually a good song. And no. I yeah, I, I liked it better than than Guns N' Roses version. And then another song mm-hmm. written by Manson and apparently was played at his funeral as well. I don't know if that's true. I just read it in an article. That's what I'm going with. Uh, but the Beach Boys song, Never Learn Not to Die. Dennis Wilson sang this song written by Manson, although Charlie had named it Cease to Exist. And he was not thrilled that Dennis had stolen it from him. <laughs> oh, Dennis mm-hmm. kicked him out of his house and stole his song. <laughs> yeah, after they friggin' moved 50 people into his house and stole a bunch of shit from him. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was owed that song. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, and then my last two songs don't refer to the Manson family directly, but they kept playing in my head while reading Helter Skelter. Uh, first was mm-hmm. House of the Rising Sun by The Animals, which that song. Oh, yeah. It gives me goosebumps. Like, Love it. I love it. And it makes me think of Slaughterhouse of the Rising Sun, that weird, creepy movie. Don't know if you ever watched it, but there was creepy hippies driving around the desert in dune buggies, and there's a murder house. And I haven't watched the whole movie because we started watching it when I was really young and we're like, this is fucked up. So we stopped watching it. But <laughs> it always gave me a, a Manson family vibe. So that's what that makes me think of. Yeah. Um, and then my last song is Signs by Tesla, because, you know, long haired, freaky people <laughs> need not apply. Exactly. <laughs> and it I just, love it. I love it so much. When I think of hippies, that is a song that comes to my mind and it just plays on repeat. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I had a couple um, of the same ones. I had the same Aussie, Aussie one as oh, you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And obviously like Helter Skelter and all of the Beatles yep. ones. So I won't go into crazy detail, but I have others yes, that just perfect. like have reasons for them all of course okay but, okay um so the song turn 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 by the mm. birds mm-hmm. has like crazy hippie vibes and on my spotify for whatever reason i don't know if it's because i have spotify family with my dad but i it keeps coming up yeah. on there while i was reading helter skelter so i was just like it's become like a song for helter skelter and it just fits so well totally it has it has the vibe it has the vibe right mm-hmm. um I have a couple different versions of Helter Skelter, actually. Okay. Um, Helter Skelter by Motley Crue, because mm-hmm. I'm a crew head <laughs> forever. Here. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then there's, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Across the Universe. No, I never did. I never watched okay, it. it. It is fucked right up. Okay. But it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> it's a musical based on Beatles songs. Right. And... The character in the movie that sings Helter Skelter is named Sadie. Oh. And she has this like raspy, like Janice Joplin-y vibe to her. And I think it's fantastic. So nice. I will check it out. Writing it down. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I put Crazy Train on here by Ozzy because that'd be a crazy train. Totally. Yep. I mean, um, really, they drove around in a black bus, but it might as well have been a crazy train. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, another hippie vibe one is Sunshine of My Love by Cream. Mm, yeah. Because it's like the hippiest of vibes. I love it. Right? I I'm just saying, I am so psyched for this playlist because it's, I know it's going to be so good. It's going to, it's like really chill hippie vibes, but at the same time, there's that undertone of murder. So, you know, it's right? kind of what I'm all about. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one is super weird, but mm. it's very fitting. Mm. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite by the Beatles. It is so fucking weird. <laughs> and it's like right up their acid filled alleys. Like, it's- oh, perfect perfect yeah. <laughs> I can't so think of it weird off the top of my head but I'm sure I I can picture it because I've heard a lot of their acid filled songs so I just know right yeah um and so I found this other one it's mm-hmm. called the Charles Manson blues by oh. the flaming lips yeah okay so I and it's I it's looked at that and I meant to listen to it and then I 
totally got sidetracked and I did not bring it up. So yeah. 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 It's interesting. Yeah. Um, but definitely talks about Manson and <laughs> I'm sure. And my last one is Piggy by Nine Inch Nails because it was actually recorded at 10,050 Cielo Drive. What? I didn't. Okay. I did not know that. I was going to put that on my list, yes. but then I decided yes. not to. He re- oh, amazing. Reznor recorded that whole album at 10,050 Cielo Drive. Oh my God. This just, that blew my mind. That's amazing. Yeah. You're welcome. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to immediately go check that out. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I need to listen to it while in that headspace of like imagining that whole yes. production, you know, yes. that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and if you go and read about it, he's, he's kind of changed his tune about how he felt about it when he actually recorded there. And he's mm-hmm. like, you know, people actually died here. So maybe I was being a little disrespectful, but you know, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. But, whatever. you know, makes for a good story I guess we're pretty psyched about it (laughs) exactly exactly excellent awesome well I am so psyched and if anybody else just saying you can add to our playlist as well just let us know we would love Mm -hmm. that I want to know what you guys what thought songs make you think of Charlie Manson (laughs) exactly 100% let me know um what questions do you still have none I don't really have anything lingering you that's fantastic. Um, well, okay. I have one question and it very well could have been answered, but I, I probably just missed it. But did they ever find out whose glasses were found at the Tate house? Okay. I do have questions. <laughs> Same. Cause I like, I, I don't think they did because I think it, they must've been a, a friend or something of Sharon Tate's. Okay. 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 Because if anybody they weren't know. from anybody. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't from anybody of the family. Right. Okay. And they weren't any of the victims. Okay. If anybody knows, please let me know. Because like when I was researching and writing, I was keeping that in the back of my head because I'm like, I need to wrap that part up. Like, you know, I don't want to leave any loose ends, but that one, I just never found the conclusion to. And I tried to search it and Mm -hmm. nothing comes up when I was, when I was searching for it. So I'm like, am I, did I just miss it? Is it really obvious or did they just never bring it up? ever again <laughs> so I think I think Bugliosi did I think he said that they found out that it didn't belong to any of okay. the family it didn't belong to any of you know the, the victims. victims right so they assumed it was a somebody okay. who'd been at the house okay okay I'll accept that I just didn't know if there was something blaringly obvious that I missed <laughs> um and then mm-hmm. something that I always think about is why wasn't Squeaky one of the most dedicated members of the family? Why wasn't she involved in the murders? And I do have a theory on this, but it always comes to mind. What are hmm, your thoughts your on theory? it? What's your theory? What's your thoughts on it first? <laughs> I'm going to say she wasn't involved in the murders because she was dealing with George. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. I figure that, I mean, that's 100%. I think that's part of it. Um, I just, I feel like, It was known that if something were to go down, if they were to get caught, that she would continue on the family and she would be Mm -hmm. the head of it. Yeah, that's probably good too. Yeah. Because I feel like I thought, well, Mary Bruner, she was like number one, like she was like the mother. Mm -hmm. But I feel like nothing happened with her after like the family went to jail. Like she just kind of petered out of existence. But like Squeaky was always at the front of everything. Like she was there. So I feel like Manson knew that dedicated yeah I feel but like yeah Manson she did. always stayed close to home I actually yeah I don't know if you guys saw our Instagram stories where I actually did my mother-in-law's chickens oh yes <laughs> <laughs> so they we have Charles and the family but mm-hmm. like there's one she's a, a little black hen she hardly ever leaves the chicken coop mm-hmm. like she's always like in the chicken run she's never out in the yard and I'm like squeaky stays close to home so that's squeaky huh. but even <laughs> even my kids now like we get there and my son's like Hey, there's Charles and his family. And it makes me laugh every single time. <laughs> oh my God. I just, I can't even express how like happy that makes me, which is ridiculous because they're chickens, but like, man, <laughs> you're, yeah. yeah, just when, every time you send me videos of the, the family, I'm just like, oh, I love it. I know. Yeah. I tried explaining I this. And I mean, I guess they're technically my chickens now. I guess oh. so. 
<laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. You have a cult of chickens. I have chickens. I have a cult of chickens. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> I tried explaining it to my parents because while you were sending me videos, they were there and I was laughing about it and they just, they thought we were strange. And I'm like, you know what? I'm sure others well, will understand. <laughs> Our people will understand. Right? And if you see them together, he's like the absolute leader and they're just like following him around and doing whatever he says. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Anyways, that was my little chicken sidebar. <laughs> right. Well, like we said, we always, we always got to have one, some farming yeah. or weather related <laughs> comment. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't bring up Charles and the family, the chickens during the Charles Manson case at some point, I right. mean, I mean, what, what are you doing? Nobody would know that I have a cult of chickens. Exactly. <laughs> this is important information. <laughs> right. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, anyways, what did you Google while reading the book, Tara? <laughs> Just everything, like everything, every single aspect of this case I Googled. Um, unfortunately, I ran into some pretty graphic crime scene and autopsy photos of the victims, mm. which 10 out of 10 That's unfortunate. would not recommend. I don't know how those popped up. Like I've Googled this case how many times and never seen anything, but eventually yeah. Yeah, stumbled upon those. Not cool. Um, obviously, I had to find pictures of everyone so I could put faces to names. So that, uh, so that part was mm -hmm. very time consuming. Um, and I spent a lot of time on Google maps, finding the locations of everything. And then I got really sad that I didn't visit any of the locations when I was in Los Angeles a few years ago, but it was at least helpful for me to visualize everything since I've been in those parts. Like I, I went to Griffith park. So I was really close oh, to that's cool. home and, nice. and that kind of stuff. So I, I really could picture everything that was happening in the case. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. What about you? Oh, the usual, you know, pictures of the family, what mm -hmm. they look like now, what Charles Manson died of, his 18-year-old almost bride, you know, um, the basics. Basics, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, did you watch any uh, TV shows or movies related to this Booker case? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. Um, I watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, mm. which is an adaptation with an alternate ending made by Quentin Tarantino, which... You know, it's fun. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not the story yep. at all, okay, okay. but it's Quentin Tarantino and I love a good Quentin Tarantino, but totally, you know, the dog's the hero in the movie. So, oh, well, that's sweet. <laughs> that's all that matters. Yeah. I tried and finding, that I watched him. Sorry. I tried finding that movie so I could watch no, it beforehand go ahead. and it's mm -hmm. on Netflix or on prime. So then I, yeah, that's, that's all I got. So I didn't watch it. Then I was sad. Yeah. 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 Des slept through it and he loves Quentin Tarantino. So I was like, oh, well, oh. So it's, not, it's not as graphic as like no. Reservoir Dogs or like Pulp Fiction or anything like that. But I still liked it because of the backstory. Right. It's about the neighbors to Sharon Tate. Right. Oh, so oh, interesting. They're okay. like looking in. On thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also watched American Horror Story Cult, which yeah. there's a lot of Charlie in. Yeah. See, I'm not yeah. there yet. I'm Cult not at that season so it's it's messed right up mm -hmm. and yeah it's it's dark mm. it gets weird the cult leader has manifestations of like different cult leaders so like they talk about david koresh and you know jim jones and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of those guys <laughs> yeah, yeah manson mm -hmm. and then like the manson family is like reenacted and it's yeah nice. it's American Horror Story. Yeah, so. I'm only, I haven't started season three yet, so I'm a ways away, but I, I just can't wait for that season. I feel like it's going to be one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They do an interesting spin on it. I don't oh. want to wreck it, but yeah, no. sounds good. Um, if you had the chance to ask the author one question. I didn't get to answer. <laughs> oh, <I did>. <laughs> <laughs> let's back right up. What was your answer, Whoop. Tara? <laughs> I I have long answers, so I'm like, this is important. Well, okay. So I watched some interviews and documentaries, which was great. Um, mm -hmm. I watched the Diane Sawyer documentary on Charles Manson and the family, and it included Charles Manson himself, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten. And it, it was incredible. I highly recommend it. It's all over YouTube. Um, but it's fascinating to see 
them talk about the case themselves. It's incredible, like I said. And then I watched an interview of Susan Atkins from 1976 on fraternal affairs, which honestly just pissed me right off because she talked in her like soft and innocent voice and didn't take any responsibility ah, for anything. Up. She said that she and Tex had done either coke or speed before the murder. So of course it was the drug's fault. And then she claimed that Tex killed every person in the Tate house. So then it was his fault. But then there was Charlie and his deprogramming. So then it was his fault. Like grow up. You boasted about those murders. You are proud of what you did. You can't say you're a reformed Christian and that you've changed and that you're a better person if you can't admit any guilt. Yeah, fuck right off, Sadie. It just, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, it made me mad. Um, but yeah, sorry. That was my last crazy Sadie rant, I swear. I just had, <laughs> I had to get one more in because she pisses me off. <laughs> um, I also watched clips of interviews with Skeeky. Skeeky? Skeeky. Wow. Geeky, uh, squeaky from me and Diane Lake, which was fascinating as clearly they had very different views and memories of Manson. Squeaky says that he was a great guy. He saved them all. He didn't order anyone to do anything and she's still in love with him. And Diane talks about his dark side, the abuse, his pimping, all of that nasty stuff. So it was just a great contrast. Interesting. Yes. So those were great. I believe they were interviews from ABC News. So yeah, you can find them on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have, this is a long list. <laughs> no, that's okay. Go nuts. Uh, Manson Family Vacation on Netflix. I don't know if you've ever watched it, but it kept popping no. up on my timeline. So it's about a guy that was obsessed with the Manson family and he took his brother to check out all the locations. And then he ended up meeting up with the remaining family members. And it turns out that he was actually Manson's son and he had been conversing with Manson in prison. And it's crazy, but wow. it, it, was a, it was a good story. And of course it was fiction, but it was well done. And I could relate to aspects of it because obviously, like I was just saying, I would have loved to visit some of the totally. lo locations. And that's what they were doing, like going to the gate, trying to like get into the properties to like look around. Nice. And yeah, it was, it was pretty well done. I enjoyed it. And then I watched Rosemary's Baby as it was directed by Roman Polanski, uh, which is a, a classic horror that I hadn't seen before. You and, know, I've never seen it either. Yeah, well, it's on Amazon love Prime. Love classic horror, but I've never seen that one. Amazon Prime. It was released in 1968, which was a year before the murders took place, and it's said to be a cursed film. And mm -hmm. Sharon Tate was often on set and made an appearance in the background during one of the party scenes. So it just, it adds to the creepy vibe. Theory. Yeah. Um, I was, I was going to watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like I, like I said, but I could not find it. Mm. Um, and then there's also a movie based on Helter Skelter, um, that I wanted to watch, but I couldn't find that one either. Hmm. And lastly, you just watched this, <laughs> the haunting of Sharon Tate. I, mm, I literally just watched this. Like it ended minutes before we started recording <laughs> <laughs> and I am not kidding when I say that I was walking around my house yelling about it, like <laughs> yelling. I knew it was good because you sent me a Snapchat. So yeah. And thank goodness my husband wasn't home to witness that because I was freaking mad. And it's good that I don't have neighbors because they would think I'm crazy. So it's, it's, it just, it pissed me off. Okay. <laughs> I knew it'd be different, but it was <laughs> really, it was just, it was so inaccurate. And so, okay. So Hillary Duff plays Sharon Tate. And then I no. think, yes. <laughs> and then um, Jay Sebring is played by the main dude in um, Mean Girls, like the one that the girls like. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, anyways. So cast was a little bit meh. Like they weren't, they didn't really suit the roles. And their attempt on like the 60s vibe was literally just putting a headband around Hillary Duff's head and calling it good. Like there was no 60 vibes. It just, 
it was a poor attempt. And I don't know, just everything about it. The Tate house was not quite it. Like I thought I was like, is this supposed to be a farm? And then I was like, oh no, this is, this is the Tate house. These look like barns. They don't look like the Tate house. Like it was pissing me off. Okay. There's so many. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think I'll watch it. (laughs) No, you have to watch it. You have to watch it. And Okay. Let me know. You have okay. to. There, and just so many inaccuracies, which makes me mad. Obviously, it's not 100% like based on the murders, but like also the murders are so crazy that you don't need to add a bunch of creative stuff to it. It's already no. crazier than a movie could ever be, right? But they had to add a bunch of shit to it. Mm-hmm. Um, they made it so um, Sharon Tate was mad at Abigail and Wojciech. And her and Jay would be talking about them, calling them um, squatters from hell and all this stuff. It was fucking weird. (laughs) And that they had something to do with planning Sharon's death. And Charlie kept coming around the house, trying to give them tapes to give to um, Terry Melcher. And then, I don't okay, it was so weird. It was so weird, man. They did some things well, like they used actual footage at some parts. And they did use Manson's actual song, like him singing. But then they they ruined it. Yeah. Um, but the part that really made me start yelling in my house was when she got home and then there was this guy that was working in the yard and she's like, who are you? And he's like, I was like, okay, this must be William Gerritsen, right? And he's going to be like, oh, hi, I'm William Gerritsen. Mm-hmm. I'm the yeah. caretaker that lives in the guest house. Nice to meet you. No, no. He's like, oh, hi, I'm Stephen Parent. I'm the caretaker. I just started. I live in the trailer over there. I would have I would have turned it off. Honestly, I, I would have turned it off right there. Just started yelling no. No. <laughs> like I couldn't stop yelling no, and I was so mad about it. So then Stephen Parent had this huge part in the movie. He was in their house like fixing the the tape player no. because it kept randomly turning on and playing Charlie's music. So then he was in there fixing it. Um and then during the murder scene, one of the murder scenes, there was multiple because some were dreams and some were not. Um, but he started leaving to go get the cops because something was wrong. And then he ran into the the Manson family. And then um, Sharon Tate ran out and jumped in his car with him. And then they started shooting at Sharon and Steven in the car. And then there was a big chase. And they ended up back in the Somehow house. It, it went down. It was horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible. So it, it I just... don't know that I want to watch it, dude. Sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so bad that it's you have to watch it. You have okay. to watch it. So sorry. seven days left of quarantine. <laughs> I mean, the good thing is it's it's not like it's gonna scare you. Like it, no. So that's why I was worried because I'm like, I was home alone this weekend and I'm like, oh boy, I should watch a scary movie by myself, but I just got right pissed off about it. <laughs> okay. Well, well. I can definitely do that. (laughs) And um, basically it ended up being alternate realities in in the end. Mm. There was the them getting murdered and then there was a version where they murdered the the family. So. Oh, good. Yeah. (laughs) So that's all I'll say about that. You go watch it and everybody else go watch it and please tell me your thoughts. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Sorry. That was long, but I just had so many feels about this movie because I just got done watching it. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So fantastic. Back to now. I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. (laughs) Uh, If you had the chance to ask the author one question, Mm -hmm. what would it be? Or a person involved in the case? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would ask ask Vincent, did the fear of the Manson family coming after you ever wear off? Or did you always have that fear and anxiety in the back of your mind? (laughs) I'm laughing because I asked the same damn thing. Did you? Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Like I said, how scared for your life were you throughout the trial and after? And was there a point where you stopped being afraid? Well, yeah, because there were so many family members and they were just out and about, including Squeaky. Um so like, do you ever stop being afraid that this group of crazy psychos is going to kill you? Like, I feel like your they're, family? they're not ones that just let things go. <laughs> no. Right? No. Funny though, that our brains went to the same place. Yeah. Out of all of the questions we could have asked. I know. Excellent. <laughs> Interesting. 
<laughs> um, I'll just ask these next two questions at the same time. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read other books by this author? And would you read more books by this author? Have not yet, mm -hmm. but I definitely would. Mm -hmm. um, his book, Outrage, The Five Reasons Why O.J. Simpson Got Away with Murder is on my must read list. Mm -hmm. And also my mom highly recommends Till Death Us Do Part, mm -hmm. which is about the Palico Stockton trial. And I know absolutely nothing about it, but mom says it's a fantastic book. So it sounds so familiar, but I can't think of what happened. So sounds interesting has like that me. old like loved copy as well mm -hmm. so yeah so must mm -hmm. be a good one mm -hmm. you basically said the same thing I have not read any other books by Vincent Bugliosi but I absolutely would um I think I would have to spread them out over a bit of time because mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. all of his books are going to be super intense like this so I just need some mm -hmm. light reading in between but I would definitely definitely read more from him the OJ one like you mentioned and also the JFK assassination one looked quite interesting as well. Sounds like oh, he's yeah. got some, I don't know if I'd say controversial, but like he's got some opinions about that and the conspiracy, mm -hmm. theory, conspiracy theories behind that mm -hmm. whole case. So I think that would be really interesting. Um, and then as for Kurt Gentry, again, yes, I would read more from him. He's got a book about J. Edgar Hoover. And it's called The Man and the Secrets. And it looks fascinating. Um, Hoover was, of course, the first. That's the one that I would read of his, too. Yes. Hoover was the first director of the FBI. And it seems like he had a lot of unchecked power and was able to manipulate a lot of people in a lot of situations. So I think this book oh, really yeah. Yeah. spills <laughs> the tea on all of that. And I'm, I'm very intrigued. I'm all about so the tea. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like mm -hmm. that'd be a really good one. Yeah. I know my mom tried to read Outrage by Bugliosi, hmm. but it was right after all of the things that had happened. Like OJ had been in hmm. the news for so long and we were like flooded with information about OJ. Yeah. And then she got given it as a gift and then she tried to read it and she was just like done with it yeah. at that point. She's like, I just can't. So I don't think she ever actually wound up finishing it, but right. I Which... definitely be interested in it. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. I mean, at some points you just like, you hit a wall with a case, like, and you're like, oh, and no more. I mean, OJ was before your time, but oh, yeah. it was everywhere. But I can, it was I can imagine at that point it would just be overwhelming and just like, right. Oh, that's enough of that. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 But it's, Wait, uh, one day, one day we'll do OJ. Yes. And we'll do his book that he wrote. Because I just learned that my girlfriend has a copy of that. Nice. And we'll read Vincent Bugliosi's as well. we'll That do sounds double. fantastic. Okay. Good plan. Mm -hmm. Good plan. I like this. Would you recommend this book to others? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> just, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think. No, of course no. I would. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And yep. It said all Merlotters murderinos true crime junkies everybody you all need to read this book it's a rite of passage basically totally yeah totally mm -hmm. listen to the audiobook whatever mm -hmm. yeah if you don't have that yeah. if you don't have like 27 hours to sit down and, and read this book then listen to the audiobook right um what would you rate this book tara well you know i don't think i could rate a book that has had such an impact on me, like such a big impact, anything less than 10 out of 10. So that would be, that would be my 10 answer. 10 out of 10 cats is what I gave it too. 10 out of 10 cats. I just, I just, I, I have to. It's incredible. It, there's so much work put into it. I can't even imagine the time and the energy that was put into this book. Like it deserves, deserves all the cats. Totally. Mm -hmm. All the cats. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any listener feedback or um, um, anything from anything that not about the um, well early on when we first started posting about it, um, Andrea on Instagram mm. uh, commented that she read this when it came out and right. she it, it scared the shit out of her when she read it and mm -hmm. it's been a case that she's followed ever since so right. um, that was probably the the biggest feedback that I got but mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. nice to hear it. And, Great. Absolutely. Hopefully we did it justice. I sure hope so, man. I really do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I tried really hard anyways. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just checking all our social media just to make sure that nobody had had emailed us in the last little bit. But no, I didn't get any um, 
any feedback about Helter Skelter itself, but you know, we're always open to it, guys. Book clubs are interactive. Yes. And even if it's after book club episodes come oh. out, we will love to read your reviews and we'll email you back and forth. And I'm telling fun. you, I will, I don't even have to say this, but I will talk about the Manson murders or Helter Skelter <laughs> anytime, any day, like hit me up, come at me. Like I'm ready to talk about it. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. So don't care when, but you can always talk to me about that. Exactly. Excellent. And yeah, make sure to answer um, answer our questions if you've read the book. Um, obviously, let let us know what you think about the episode. Mm-hmm. You can email us at murderandmerlot at gmail.com. Find us on Instagram at Murder and Merlot Podcast, Facebook at Murder and Merlot Podcast, and Twitter at Murder and Merlot One. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere else you can find podcasts. We would love if you subscribed, and if you don't, you're a dead to me. And we are reading Small Sacrifices by Anne Rule um, for our next book, which is, like I said last week, is awesome. Mm -hmm. It is horrible and psychotic and yes, awesome. Uh, Anne Rule's a goddess. She's Mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's writing this story that's horrible. And I'm like, man, I just really like her. Like, I mean, you just want to keep reading, even though it's, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, it's terrible, and, but she does a very good job. Yeah, I'm sure she does. I'm ready to fully shift gears and commit to the story now. So I'm excited to dive in. Yeah. When I'm in a book, when I'm in a case, I like oh, commit I, fully I to it. I I really dive in. So now I feel like I can finally move past mm-hmm. Helter Skelter. I think I've said all the things that I needed to say about it. We'll see yeah. something will probably pop in my head in the middle of the night tonight, but um, I'm <laughs> super excited to shift gears here and dive into a new story. Yeah. It's a good one. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Good one. But yeah, man, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're weird, whatever you guys know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and remember to drink wine because it's not good to keep things bottled up. Bye. Bye.